both Rita and Tom for your very nice introductions, and I might say very generous introductions. Uh, it's freezing up here because there's wind blowing right down on me. <laughs> well, as, as Rita mentioned, the truth keepers, and uh, I'll talk more about that a little bit, that truth. Uh, it's my 15th book, some are fiction, some are, well, some are historical fiction, I should say. Some are nonfiction, and there is one book of poetry. And I was really surprised I sold a lot of poetry books yesterday. It was amazing. Um, the Truth Keepers, as Rita mentioned, is a sequel to Marguerite's Landing. It's the second part of a trilogy I'm working on. And the third one is nearing completion. When I say that, I mean it's, I have a full draft, but I revise over and over and over. So it will depend on how many revisions I still want to do. Um, but it's the entire trilogy. Each book stands on its own. I think you can read each book individually, independently, and not read the others if you choose. But if you want the full story of the, and I'm going to use both terms, Dubignon, Dubignon family, then the three of them and their connection with Jekyll Island, that's what I've focused on. It's from the top, the Marguerite's Landing is about the first generation and the Truth Keepers is about the second generation of that family. And the third generation will be, the third and fourth generation will be covered in the final book, which is as yet untitled, since that's always the last thing I do. It has about four titles, you know, that I play with along the way, and you usually find something totally different at the end. Um, for those of you who may not have read Marguerite's Landing, uh, it tells, as I said, it tells the story of the first generation of the Dubignon, because that's what they were at the time. The Dubignon family uh, of Jekyll Island and their arrival from France. They were, of course, a family of the French merchant nobility. And they came here to escape the French Revolution. Well, fortunately, I taught French. And so I was able to read all their letters and documents and that sort of thing, which I found to be rather helpful in the process of doing research on these people. Uh, but it, it's the story of a, a young, fairly young family in, an, in our early republic, in the beginnings of our own country. George Washington had been president for just a very short while. Uh, and each, uh, Marguerite Lossier, again, this is Marguerite's Landing, uh, and their two sons left France in 1792, right in the middle of the terror, the French terror of the revolution. Uh, French, Christophe had been a sea captain and um, a privateer. Anybody know what a privateer is? Sort of a legal pirate, you know. Uh, at the time of the American Revolution, in fact, uh, he was, a, I don't think he really thought about it as assisting in the American Revolution, but he raided mostly English ships, so it was a big help to us during our revolution. And they settled on Jekyll Island and became cotton planters, as you well know. And Marguerite's Landing relates the story of their departure, their arrival in America, uh, a little bit about their pre-story, and uh, just, it's good background for the book I'm going to be talking about today. But as I say, it's not essential. It would be helpful if you have read it or if you'd like to read it first and then read this one. The new book, The Truth Keepers, tells the story of and again, I'm, his name is Henri Duignon, which evolves into Henry Dubignon. And I may go back and forth. I never know what's going to come out, you know. <laughs> In any case, uh, the, the first, he's the second son of the Dubignon family. Uh, and he inherits the island by virtue of his brother's disinheritance. Uh, his brother married... Uh, this, uh, a daughter of one of Marguerite's 
children from her first husband. It gets rather convoluted sometimes when you read about these, this family, but it's, uh, it's a fascinating, absolutely fascinating family, and I have been fascinated with it for about 30 years now, so I, it's, uh, you know, I think you'll enjoy them. The, the first son falls out of favor for that reason, inherits only $50 in his father's will, which was the same amount uh, to which he had left a slave woman who was most likely his mistress and his daughter. Um, but we, he learned from, um, Henry, Henri, learned from his father's experience. And his father had been a successful planter most of the time, but he always had vicissitudes. You know, there were ups and downs, and uh, there were storms, there were insects, there were droughts, there were invasions, the British invasion of the island and so forth. So instead, Henry, Henri, and he and his wife decide they're going to Americanize their name. So. Henry decides that he ought to have more income than just plantation cotton. So what he does is get involved in the Brunswick community. And in a sense, uh, not this book so much, but my third book will be as much about Brunswick, Georgia, as it is about Jekyll Island, because it, it kind of moves back and forth between the two, <coughs> as they did, I should say. Um, he was a very popular man in the community, and he got involved in almost everything that was going on in Brunswick. This was kind of the boom times in Brunswick in the 1850s. And he, uh, he served the community in many capacities. He got involved with the railroad, the new railroad there, uh, in, in banking stock. Uh, he, he served as the treasurer of Glen Academy which I'm sure you're well familiar with. Um, during his heyday, he was selected to be bank president in Brunswick. And um, he, I mean, there's a lot more. He got involved in the canal project and all of those things. But uh, one of his most, well, one of his favorite activities, or one in which he was one of the most popular members, was the Aquatic Club, Club of Georgia. And the Aquatic Club, as you well may know, held boat races. In fact, they once challenged uh, the New York Aquatic Club to race their little boats against the little boats dug out of cypress logs that were made here. Well, New York turned them down. <laughs> well, Dominion said it's because they they were scared, you know, they didn't dare, they didn't dare do that. Their excuse was they did not want to row against servants. And because those, those piraguas were using primarily uh, slave rowers, that would, that would be who would have rowed the boats. But Dubinian and his fellow members said, well, we'll row the boats. But the New Yorkers still refused to come down. So what finally happened was the Savannah, a club in Savannah said, okay, we'll row those New York wherries and we'll come down and compete. Well, of course, they lost. So the Dubignon and his cohorts won the race. Big deal, you know, at the time. <laughs> Not too much anymore. His boat was the goddess of liberty. And uh, in a sense, I, I think a Brunswick newspaper summed it all up. Uh, when he became president of the Bank of Brunswick, they wrote that he was a man who was extensively known and highly esteemed. Well, that didn't last. Suddenly, all that changed, and he became persona non grata uh, throughout the area as a consequence of his lifestyle choices. The reputation he left behind at his death in 1866 was summed up in a personal letter from a woman I won't identify, but a, a woman who lived a little bit after him, but, but knew his family well. She summed him up as that old man who turned out so bad. <laughs> well, how could a reputation crumble to that extent, how could a reputation crumble so suddenly? What had happened to him and his family 
uh, that caused this and what happened to him in the end. Well, that's the story the Truth Keepers tells. It's all based on documented historical evidence after a great deal of research, as, as you may or may not know, I've done a lot of research on Jekyll Island. And these books have led me not just to sources in, in Georgia and, and, and Paris, the French archives uh, in, in, in Paris and so forth, but um, I, I found myself digging into the archives of the Gironde in Bordeaux, France. I found myself reading uh, English, uh, papers from the various churches in England and uh, the various archives that had other information. And you might wonder why I was in the English archives digging around for these people. Well, the two characters, the two now, I've told the story, it's the only time I've ever done this, but the story is written in the first person from two perspectives. One is from Amelia Niccolo, or Amelie Niccolo, who was the wife, I should say the first wife, of Henry Dubinian, and she was French. She was actually from uh, Mauritius, a little island off the east coast of Africa, but they met there, as a matter of fact, and then eventually wound up buying a state, an estate in Brittany, in France. Very lovely estate. In fact, on that book, Marguerite's Landing, there is a photograph of their, uh, their cottage, their mansion, if you will, their, their uh, home in France. And I visited there and had lots of photographs. And when I came here the last time, I was talking about that book, and I'd planned to show you a PowerPoint uh, that revealed all of that and showed you the photographs. Unfortunately, we couldn't get it to work. So you never got to see that PowerPoint. But maybe one day we'll do it again. I don't know. Um, his, the reason I got into the archives in uh, the Gironde archives in Bordeaux was because that's where Amelia ended up living before she came to this country. She was not married to Henry when she came to this country. She was a single woman who came here with her brother. And, and, she, and then the other character, from whose point of view I tell this story, is a woman named Sarah Oust. And Sarah was a British woman uh, who, was the mother of three of Henry's children without benefit of marriage. And Henry never, <clears throat> never seemed to tire of, um, how, what's a polite way to say it? Well, sex. <laughs> and, he, and, and he fathered at the time of his death, again, 1866, <clears throat> we know, we have documentation to know that he fathered 21 children. <laughs> But there are probably others we don't know about. I mean, those are just the ones we can document. Um, uh, in, this, in the book, I never let Henry tell his own story. And one of my, uh, one of my readers, my, my friend of mine, who said, I bet if Henry told that story, it would sound, it would be really different. And that may well be true. But I chose not to let Henry tell his own story. There are two seats right up here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in any case, it's told from the, the women's point of view. And uh, thank you for, for coming, and I'm glad we had a seat. Um, but I think his own story would reflect uh, perhaps a very different perspective, as the two women's stories reflect a very different perspective. But these are their truths. Uh, the novel contains a lot of information that's entirely new, um, especially about the two women in Henry's life. And I found their stories just as fascinating as his own. Much of the narrative, as I said, is based on new research from the archives I spoke of. I've been asked whether I don't find the extensive research I do for all these books really boring, tedious, 
uh, overwhelming? <laughs> and the answer is no. It's a treasure hunt for me. I love doing the research. Uh, I, I do, <laughs> I'm one of those weird people who does research for fun, you know, but in any case, it is time consuming work. And that's why it takes years to sometimes get these books out. Uh, if I were paid by the hour, I would never, I would probably make about 10 cents an hour, all told. Uh, but that's unfortunately not the way I'm paid. So in any case, um, when I, 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 what I do, the, my process is to do a lot of the research up front, okay? And then I kind of visualize my story as best I can. I kind of think it out very flexibly, mind you. And then I decide to start writing. Well, when I write and I come to something I don't know, I dive back into the research and do it once more. So it, again, it takes a while to do this. Um, mixing, historical fiction is about really in, enlarging on history, if you will. So much of history, we don't know. So much of history falls between the cracks of the documents that we have. And doesn't, it doesn't breathe life sometimes into history. Historians do that to some extent, but not to the extent that a writer of historical fiction can do. And I love writing historical fiction. Um, but I strive always. I get to add the dialogue. I get to add the emotions. I get to add the motivation. Uh, but based on what I consider to be logical clues in the original documents. And I try very hard to make the historical facts the backbone of all my books. When I can find things like the official records of Amelia's birth and baptism in Bordeaux, when I can find her actual passport when she came to America in 1804, when I can find a poem actually written by Sarah Oust, or I can find uh, things like um, records of her clandestine marriage and uh, such things, um, my imagination begins to take hold, as you might imagine, and fill in things fairly easily, like dialogue and motivation, um, which those are rarely documented, but they can be deduced, I think. Of course, I don't know what specific clothes they wore. I don't really know what they ate for dinner, but I can sort of, I can study the types of dress people wore in plantations in those days. I can research the kinds of foods they ate. I can research the kind of glasses they wore. I can research all those tiny details. And those are the ones mostly I get into after I've started working on the book because they always come up. I once made a mistake about a cake recipe. Uh, actually, it was in, it was in um, Almost to Eden. Someone mentioned that book earlier. And uh, someone wrote to me and said, you got it wrong. And I said, well, I, and I, I did some research. Sure, she was right. And I wrote her back and I said, well, you can tell I'm not a gourmet cook. That's one thing for sure. <laughs> um, but I, I don't know exactly what Amelia said to her husband when she learned about the first illegitimate child he, was father, he had fathered by, by Sarah Oust. Uh, but I can put myself in her place and think what I might have said to my husband. But sometimes my personal reactions don't fit the character. <laughs> So I have to kind of think through other options. Okay, what, what would this woman have said, not what would I have said or done? But I try, again, never to write anything that can be disproved. We all make mistakes from time to time, as you can see from my cake recipe, but uh, it's, we do, we, only God is perfect, right? So we, we in fact, in, in, the, uh, in the Muslim world, they deliberately, in those beautiful carpets that they weave and so forth, they deliberately create a flaw because there's no uh, perfection on this earth. Yeah. So I hope you'll forgive me if you run across another recipe or uh, uh, bodice out of place or a sleeve that's not right or something of that sort. In any case, um, 
I, well, one of the things I discovered was that the age was always been given of uh, Amelia, uh, the age that's in her magic, re her marriage records. It's not right. She was not as young as Henry thought she was. Um, not a lot older, but younger. And the reason is why. I mean, we have to think about why would she let him think she was younger than she really was. Uh, similarly, Sarah Owl's story has never been fully told. Um, and I was fortunate enough to discover in these church records and archives uh, details about her life I had no clue about. I learned about her family background. I love this. I learned this story about her runaway marriage, so to speak, in England, the one that brought her to America. I learned the story of her firstborn child, which I had not known before. And one unique aspect of this novel is, as I said before, it's the only one I've written from the first person. Well, I've been asked, I've been told actually by other writers, you don't want to write in the first person. It's very limiting. Uh, you, you, you just, you don't want to do that. You can't see anything that they didn't see. You can't feel anything they didn't feel. Well, I uh, had a ball doing it. I just like to become those women in those stories. And I wanted them to tell their own stories without judgment from some other character in the story. Um, you're welcome to judge them, but not from the other characters. I didn't want them judged from that perspective. And I found it worked, for me at least, wonderfully in this book. I loved writing in the first person. Uh, and I hope you will, uh, will agree when you read it, but you can let me know if you want to. I'll be happy to hear. Any comments? Uh, I have been asked how I differentiate, differentiate between these women who were def very different in terms of background and personality. But um, one was, it, I found it relatively easy because one was French and one was English. So I did it with language. Uh, it, Amelia used terms and words that might have existed in both French and English, uh, occasional French words. Amelia, I used English spellings, as you may notice. No, it's not misspelled because it's spelled O-U-R. That's the way she would have spelled it. And uh, I, I tried to use foods as another way. Sarah had tea and biscuits, and Amelia loved the sauces that were served over at the, at the uh, John Cooper's house when she first arrived. And she's first living uh, on St. Simon's uh, with the John Cooper family. And um, that too is a kind of an interesting story about why she was there and what was going on. But in any case, um, and I had her call her grandparents or her children's grandparents, uh, Papi and Meme, which would be the equivalent of what a French child might call his or her grandparents. Um, but their stories are, are different and their worlds are different. And I hope I've reflected some of that in this book. One of the most interesting things about writing this book was that I wrote the epilogue first. And the way that came about, I was having a really hard time getting started with this book. I didn't know exactly how I wanted to tell the story. I knew the stories, but how do you do it? And so I knew what I wanted, how I wanted the book to end. I knew what the epilogue was going to be. And so one, one week, a, friend, a writer friend of mine and her niece, who was also a writer, came down to visit me at Jekyll Island. And we decided that we would spend, we would all go separate ways and spend the morning writing. And then in the afternoons, we would come together and critique each other's work. Well, I had to come up with something. And all I had was the epilogue. <laughs> so I wrote that first. Um, anyway, it was, a, it was a lot of fun. And the, after that, the novel flowed much more easily. I loved that weekend, it was, or that week. It was really a very... Um, a very helpful weekend for, for all of us, I think. And by the way, her niece was, I think, 16 years old, and she's already published some of her work. She's quite good. Her father was a writer as well. Well, there's so much more I could tell you about the book, uh, but I'm not going to give you a plot summary because I want you to read it. <laughs> uh, 
There, if I were just doing a plot summary, there's more I could tell you. But as I say, I don't want to spoil it. And so, um, in addition to the stories of the two women, the book inevitably gets into the constraints of women in the 19th century and the limits of their choices, the limitations of their choices. Uh, and that was true whether you were a slave woman or whether you were a free woman, whether you were wealthy or whether you were poor. Obviously, the wealthy uh, plantation class had more choices than some of the others, but they weren't unlimited, as women's choices, I think, are today. Of course, um, the choices were fewer for the enslaved women of Jekyll Island than they were uh, for the others. And I do get into a relationship in the next book about the, uh, a relationship between, well, actually twice, about an enslaved woman. And these are true. These are based on, again, based on fact. But uh, between a slave woman and her plantation master. Um, I would encourage you, in, in terms of all these books, to read the author's password. Uh, no, not password, afterword, sorry about that. I'm not giving you my password. Uh, <laughs> but if you want the fuller story, I, I always, and in this next book, I think I'm going to start my afterword by saying, if you want a happy ending, stop reading, close the book, and end. If you want to know the rest of the story, read the afterword, and you'll get the rest of the story. Uh, I think that it's, I, I, I as a reader at least, enjoy knowing what the writer went through and how they gained, how they found their information, and why they made certain decisions and certain choices in writing the book. But um, it, it may not be for everybody, so if you don't like that sort of thing, feel free to close the book, walk away. Or, but read it first. Yeah. Okay, um, I think I may have told this group before, but I'm sure there are people here who were not here the last time I may or may not have told this story. I can't really remember. Um, I, how did I get interested in Jekyll Island? Because I don't even, I don't live in Georgia. I did go to Agnes Scott. I did do my graduate work at Emory, and I was actually on the faculty there for three years before my husband took a job in Tennessee, and I went with him and took a job at Middle Tennessee State University, uh, where I spent 37 years uh, teaching French and humanities and literature. Um, but we decided, Bart and I decided, and he was the co-author of the first book I wrote, which was the Southern uh, the Jekyll Island Club, Southern Haven for America's Millionaires. We started writing that book in 1983, and he said, oh, we can knock this out in the summer. Ha, ha, ha. We finally published it in 1989. <laughs> but... And unfortunately, he died two years later, so he never got to help with any of the other books, I'm sad to say. But he was a wonderful writing partner and a wonderful husband and all those. Well, he was just wonderful. But let me tell you how, how it all began. My husband, Bart, and I uh, both loved the seashore. We had never been to Jekyll Island. We'd never been to St. Simons. Uh, we knew nothing about the Georgia coast, except that it was there. And we, we may have heard a little bit about St. Simon's, so we started there. We thought, okay, we, we'll work our way down. The, we didn't want, I don't know why we didn't start in South Carolina, because that was where I was born. But we started in Georgia. And uh, we came first to St. Simon's and looked around and couldn't find the beach. So <laughs> we gave up on St. Simon's. <laughs> And I went over there today, and I can tell you something. I'm really glad we did. Oh, my God. We sat in traffic for 25 minutes trying to get to our destination. Just off, slow go, slow go, slow go kind of traffic. I have never seen such, well, I've seen that kind of traffic before, but never on the islands. And it was really unfortunate that it's gotten that way. But Jekyll, 
Only when there are fireworks. I did sit on the causeway <laughs> one hour on the causeway trying to get onto Jekyll Island at Christmas. And you had just had some kind of fireworks out here. And the traffic was moving off the island wonderfully, but you couldn't get on. I never totally figured out why, but that's what it was. Well, Bart and I, well, as I said, loved the beach. And we decided we'd, we'd look, so we started St. Simons. Then we came to Jekyll. Well, we liked Jekyll. It was nice, but there were no signs to tell us what to do or where to go or anything. We didn't find the historic district or any of that. And so we said, okay, we'll just go on down to Florida. And we got to a place called New Smyrna Beach. And we found a really nice condo, sort of a high-rise thing. Which, thank God there aren't any on Jekyll Island. And we had a beautiful balcony. And we said, oh, this, this looks nice. We'll just buy this. We, so we spent the night in the apartment, and we got up the next day with our pens in hand, ready to sign. And I got a cup of coffee and walked out of the balcony. There was an 18-wheeler driving down the beach. <laughs> and I went back inside and said, Bart, I don't think this is our place. <laughs> and so he totally agreed. And for some reason, and I really don't know why, we came back to Jekyll. I guess it was that sand in our shoes or whatever they talk about here. But we came back. And this time, we found the historic district. And for the only, well, I notice it's, it's one of these is now in the museum. But at that time, and by the time we had, up until just recently, the only time they had ever had on display, as far as I know, because I'm not down here all the time, but what they had the original documents of the Jekyll Island, the original membership list, uh, the original lot layout, uh, the original uh, club register, and we have, we're sitting here looking at all this, and Bart, who is a historian, his eyes are getting bigger and bigger, and he said, oh my God, we have to find something to read about this. <laughs> so we found out nobody had really written a book about it, and he said, well, I think we just ought to write it. And I said, okay, you know, no big deal. We can write that. We can knock it out in summer. Well, we spent the next six years <clears throat> crisscrossing the country. We went to Harvard and Yale and Princeton. We went to New York. We went to Florida. We went to uh, Chicago. We went to Boston. We went all over the country, really. Look, excuse me, looking for the old documents because you recall, you may know, that, you probably know this story, but when the state bought the island in 1947, they sent convicts out here to clean it up. And in some of these old buildings, you know, there were piles of papers and stuff like that. And that, who wants a pile of papers? So you took them out and burned them. Well, those were probably the original club records. <clears throat> we could have saved ourselves a lot of time if that bonfire hadn't happened. But in any case, it did. And um, so we finally wrote and published in the University of Georgia Press, published the book. And uh, this, the second time we came here, we stayed at a motel farther south. The first time, uh, we stayed at what today is the Jekyll, is the... Holiday Inn, yeah, and was at that time the Wanderer Motel, as some of you may remember. And uh, it was okay, but it was kind of run down, and, you know, it was in that time it was. And so the second time we came, we stayed in a hotel farther down the beach, and we discovered all this empty land, that there was so much beautiful preserved landscape on the island. We found the historic district. We fell in love with the island. Well, we were already in love with each other, but we fell in love with the island too. And we knew this was our place. Three years later, we bought a house here, which I still own. And um, it's, it's become a, a second home to me, to my children, to my whole family. Um, but when Bart saw those names like J.P. Morgan, William Rockefeller, Joseph Pulitzer, he is, <laughs> I, you know, it was just, in Georgia? What were these people doing in coastal Georgia? We didn't realize to what extent at that time, to what extent the Georgia, the Georgia coast became a kind of haven for very, very wealthy people all up and down. I mean, 
uh, the Reynolds, Thomas Edison, so many people had, had places here. No, I'm sorry, Henry Ford, not Thomas Edison, excuse me, that was Florida. Um, so anyway, we wrote the book, and uh, about the same time we were writing the first book, two young men who you may well have met, or you may know, because I believe one of them is still living and lives on Jekyll Island, uh, an architect and a lawyer, uh, came across the clubhouse, which at the time was crumbling, mm -hmm. and the, they were debating whether or not they would tear it down or whether or not they would try to restore it. It looked hopeless, frankly, because it was in such bad shape. The state had taken it over in 1947, and they had patched it up a little bit because it had been neglected for during the war years. And then they made some improvements according to 1950s taste and standards. And these two people, of course, as I'm sure you know, were Larry Evans and Vance Hughes. And at the same time we were working on our book, they were working on the Jekyll Island Club. We never got together. We never met during that time. Of course, we met later when we both said, oh, I wish I'd known you then. You would have been so much help. But we didn't know each other at the time. But I think it was the sort of coming together of those two events, which happened within a year or so of each other, it really has helped bring the island back to public interest and to life in many ways, because now you know what really happened here. You really know uh, how the millionaires lived. You see that beautiful hotel there. And uh, it's, been, it's been a labor of love for, for all, all four of us, I'm pretty sure. Unfortunately, Larry Evans passed away a few years ago. Uh, but I think Vance, it, do any of you know Vance Hughes? He's, is he still on the island? He's still living here? Great. Um, well, after Bart's death, I continued my work and wrote two more nonfiction books about the island. Uh, one of which is the one I already mentioned, the other of which was the Jekyll Island Cottage Colonies. And uh, the, the, all that's, in a sense, preamble to, to the book before you today. And as I said, it was the early years book. Have any of you read the early years book? Some of them. Okay, well, that was the book that got me interested in the Dubignon family. And nobody had really done much, anything really, about them. And it was, for me, it was, you know, I mean, I was... I was fluent in French, and it was just such a great opportunity to do that research. And you know, I can get tax deductible trips to Paris and, and that sort of thing, <laughs> uh, to Norman. Anyway, uh, I, it, it, it's the beginning of this trilogy, if you will. Uh, and God willing, and the creek don't rise, as we say down south, I hope to complete that third book uh, within the next year or so. It won't be out probably for, for another two years because publishers are slow, but I'll have it done sometime next year, or if, if not this year. Um, well, you, you pretty much know everything I have told you already, um, but, well, let me say why I decided I would turn to historical fiction. Rather, because, you know, I've, I've done history. I've done, I was not trained as a historian, but I learned quickly from my husband, and I became one. And uh, so I love doing that, but I turned to historical fiction. Why? Well, for one thing, it liberates me from all those academic apparata, apparatus like footnotes and the index and the bibliography and all the other source material lists and everything and where you have to explain every option in a footnote or something like that. So here it's a story. It's not just that. Um, I, I, uh, I did one other book I haven't mentioned here, and I did it uh, with my son, uh, Brendan Martin, and some of you may or may not know Bryn, um, but he was, um, he and I did a book together about the Jekyll Island Club itself, not the, not the history, but the current clubhouse. 
And it was, it, we did, a, not a book, but we did, yeah, we did one about the clubhouse, but we also did an article. In 2003, we published an article about the state history of the Jekyll Island Club, and uh, that was, um, it came out in a book, I think, published by the University of Alabama. I can't remember the title of the book, I'm sorry to say, but we did that in 2003, and that was a real, real another very interesting period of time on the island, as you know. Um, well, I, I, I started out, like, you probably don't want to hear all this about me, but any guys, I'm going to tell you anyway. Uh, <laughs> I started my life, when I was six years old, I wanted to be a writer. I knew I wanted to be a writer. And I grew up, went to college, did all that stuff. And then I, I wrote while I was in college. I published nothing big, but I did publish one short story in a magazine uh, a competition at Duke University. And one of the other writers in that particular volume was Ann Tyler. She kept writing. I didn't. I got sidetracked with marriage, family, an academic career and that sort of thing. But when I retired in 2004, I decided I wanted to write what I wanted to write. And so that's when I came back and started working on the historical fiction. And I've had a great time. It's been wonderful. It's been a lot of fun. Um, I think there's no way one can learn just from documents the stories of these people. And if you do, it sometimes a little dry. But uh, I get to fill those gaps, as I said. And writing historical fiction involves also knowing what to leave out. And for me, that's one of the hardest things because I keep running across these little side stories that I want to include. Oh, they're so fascinating. But you can't tell everything. You just can't. And yeah, well, you can, but it gets really boring and you get sidetracked on various and sundry things. So I have to go back and cut lots of things out of my book. Someday I'm going to publish a book of outtakes, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can hear the other stories. Um, but even in writing historical fiction, I get so enamored of certain information, details, peripheral stories. I try to include them instead, if they're in any way noteworthy, in my afterword. And there's one in particular about the uncle of Sarah Oust, who happened to live in Glen County, which is a very interesting story in and of itself. But that's something I found out, well, during the research for this book, because I had not known it. Let me see what time I have here, here. OK. Ooh. Well, it's not been too long. Okay. Um, well, I want to give you a sense of the writing style in this book. And so I'm going to read you a small portion of the beginning of the book. Truth can be a lonely place, especially if you're the only one left who knows it. During these long days, as I've sat in the flickering lamplight beside the bed of my son Joseph, Praying for his recovery, I've begun to think, too much perhaps, about why God has let it all happen and to wonder whether I could be the one to blame. The bedroom door creaks open. Felicite, dressed only in her nightgown, has crept out of her room to bring me a pile of small towels and clean rags. You'll need these, she said, softly, gazing with loving eyes at her husband's face. I take them from her before she can enter the room and pile them on the bedside table next to the oil lamp. Even in its dimmed light, I can see the tears on her cheeks. Thank you, my dear, but you're not supposed to be in here. I know, she replies, her words muted in sadness, then hearing her mother's insistent call. She turns to go back to her own room giving Joseph a last tender look. She wants to nurse him herself, but the doctor has forbidden it. She has only recently recovered from the same illness they call the winter fever, and the doctor says she's still weak and vulnerable to a relapse. Her mother is adamant that she stay in bed a while longer, although occasionally she sneaks across the hall just to be closer to her husband 
for a few moments. He had insisted on sleeping beside her when she was ill and holding her closely. I don't think he fully realized that he too could be afflicted, but he loves her so much, I don't think it would have mattered. I had suggested to him that he shouldn't lie with her for it might be contagious, but she needs me, Mama. What else would I be? Where else would I be? Unfortunately, his case is far more serious than hers was. Dr. Woodbridge has come twice, cupping my son's chest to draw out the infection and providing a tincture of morphine to ease his pain. But it has done little good. Sometimes he opens his eyes and looks at me as though he isn't sure who I am. Then, just as recognition seems about to take hold, his body is racked with coughing and his face crumples in pain. At the moment, however, he is sleeping, albeit restlessly. One particular deceit from the past has begun to weigh on me. To some it may seem a small thing, but it looms large in my memory. I have never revealed to my husband, children, or friends the truth about my life before I came to Georgia. I've never thought of myself as a liar, but still I have allowed them to believe false notions, which are now my burden to bear alone. It's far too late after so many years to go back and set them straight. None of us, I suspect, is immune to small falsehood. As I sit here daily and pray for Joseph's recovery, I tell myself, as I also tell his dear wife, that he will get better. Though deep in my heart, I know he will not. That's the kind of dishonesty, that's not the kind of dishonesty I'm talking about. That's just a gentle deception meant to soften the pain and ease the heart, for we all want him to live. He is still so young, only 36, with Mama. She's, he's still so young, only 36, with so much life before him. But I see the signs, just as I saw them in Mama, as she lay in her final illness. I know that she too, I knew that she too was dying, even as I told my rational mind daily that she would get well again to keep myself going. The deceit that causes me guilt stems from my willingness to allow others to believe things I knew to be a lie. It was never meant to harm anyone, but it troubles me to realize that my children will never know the truth about my past. At the beginning, even my friendship with Mimi was based to some extent on those, what shall I call them, omissions of the truth. Once it was done, it seemed impossible to undo. I fear that if I told the truth now, she and my family would distrust me and everything else. I don't want to be like Henry, who lived a lie and would have kept his secrets forever if he could have. I have too many sins of my own to worry about those of others. Now, for some reason, during these long and painful hours with Joseph, watching him take short, rapid breaths as he burns with fever, those old deceits are crowding in, making me wonder whether perhaps I deserved all that happened. That's all I'm going to read to you, but... <laughs> I found those in England. I found them in church records. I found them in some in Brunswick records. Uh, I found them. She was married when she came here. She was married, and she lost her husband shortly after her arrival, several years after. By then, they had three, well, two children, two little girls. And then there's a story that the family believes, though I have found no documentation for it, that they also had a son. He's never mentioned in anything I've ever found. Uh, I did include him, but I let him die early. 
So I, 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 otherwise I can't account for this, if this is true or not. And by the way, the families, families know so many stories that just aren't so. They don't, and they don't know some of the ones that are true. Uh, there is an adoption in the book, for example, that uh, I, I met one of the descendants of that particular family, and I was asking her about this adoption. She said, they didn't get adopted. There's nothing to that. Nobody did. But I have the adoption papers from the court, so I know it's true. But apparently nobody in the family knew it had happened. And... Well, that's a, that's a part of the story in the new book, in the new book, not in this book, in the new book, I'm sorry. I'm getting them mixed up, but this tells just the story of Henry, uh, Sarah, and, 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 and... Sarah lived in Brunswick? Well, here she lived, she became the tutor for the, Brun, for the Dominion children, and she lived on the island, which was far more convenient for the children than rowing over to Glen Academy every day in, in, the, in the marsh creeks. Anyway, yeah, those are the kinds of liberty. You don't know what is correct and what isn't, so you just have to make a rational decision. I figure if they think he lived, maybe he did, but he did not live long. He did not move here when Sarah moved here. Well, the history is my guide. The, as I say, the history is the backbone. So I take what I know in the historical record and use that as the structure on which I hang everything else. So it's pretty much factually true, but the, as I say, the things like emotions and conversations and those kinds of things, exactly how all this evolved is, is something I had to imagine in my own mind in a logical sense, based on what evidence I had. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I think it's very important for historical fiction writers to have that backbone in all their books. Now, some, some don't. Some take enormous liberties. Um, but I, I've chosen not to do that because I want to know the real story as so far as possible. And if I know this story, I want to share it. Yeah.